Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Well, today we are uh, so lucky and excited to have with us Murray Stein. Murray Stein is a training and supervising analyst at the International School of Analytical Psychology in Zurich, which is also known as ISAP. He has been president of the International Association for Analytical Psychology uh, from 2001 to 2004 and of ISAP Zurich from 2008 to 2012. He's a member of the Journal of Analytical Psychology Editorial Advisory Board, and he is the author of Jung's Map of the Soul and many other books and articles. Eight volumes of his collected writings have been published to date, and he lives in Switzerland and has a private practice in Zurich. And Murray has been important to all of us in our training. Um, You can't can't get through uh, (laughs) the... the, uh, Propodeuticum, the exams without uh, being told many times, just read Map of the Soul. <laughs> so, <laughs> advice we have we have also uh, passed on to our, our younger colleagues. Uh, so, Murray, it is is really a delight and an honor, and we're we're thrilled to have you on the podcast. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here with you today. So today we were going to ask Murray to opine on Jung's concept of the symbol, which in one way is so ubiquitous that I think we often take it for granted that we know what Jung is talking about or what we are talking about when we bandy about the word symbol. But actually there's a a, a tremendous amount of nuance and significance, particularly in how Jung understood symbols and their efficacy in the individuation process. So where, would, where do you think the best place to start might be, Murray? Well, as you say, it's a big topic. Basically, though, it's, Jung makes a fundamental distinction between what he calls signs and symbols. And he says a sign uh, tells you something that is familiar, gives you direction. You see a stop sign, you stop. Um, Or you see a a sign on a store, you know what's there, Sears, Sears Roebuck, whatever. Uh, But a symbol, he says, is the best possible representation of something that is still unconscious. So that's the way we take symbols. We don't try to reduce a symbol to something we already know. A symbol is something to experience. It's something to um, live with and let it speak to us over time. So um, we treat symbols with great respect in Jungian psychology because they bring us messages, we could say, from the depths of the psyche. And, of course, in religious life, symbols have been used since time immemorial to speak about God or the gods or, um, or demons or um, invisible forces. All those invisible forces, Jung concluded, as modern people, we don't believe they're out there anymore, but they exist. But they exist in the psyche. So how do we get a hold of them? How do we... Um, live with them. Well, symbols are very helpful. They give us something quite concrete that encloses um, a mysterious force or power. And then we try to um, discern what is that power um, trying to tell us or how can we use it or where will it lead us? 
But we have to be careful with symbols because they can lead us astray also. They can lead us down the garden path to all kinds of foolishness. So we, we project symbols all the time into the world around us. And um, if we aren't aware that we're projecting symbols, we believe it's reality. Um, so, Murray, could you give a few examples of that? Because I think that's so poignant and so it's so real life. Exactly. You know? <laughs> right. Um, you see, it's it's very hard to stay sane in an insane world. Um. Staying sane means you, you keep your, your head above water and you can think and you can make um, distinctions and you can see clearly sanity. But when we get caught up in an insane world with symbols flying around all over the place and we follow one and reject the other, or we split, you know, good and evil and so on, um, we're no longer capable of making very good decisions. But let me give you an example. You know what, what Starbucks is? It's a mm -hmm. coffee shop. It was, it was um, introduced to the world in Seattle uh, quite some years ago. It's a very successful coffee company. They had a new concept. So when you're walking down the street and you see a sign with, with a, an image in it, it's um, a mermaid. And that tells you, um, we call her Melusina in mythology, okay, Melusina. There's Melusina uh, on a sign, and you say, I think I'll go in and have a cup of coffee. It's a nice place, and um, you can have a seat and drink a good coffee there. Uh, and I had a friend who, who went uh, very often to uh, Starbucks in Zurich, and I asked him, why do you prefer Starbucks to the other coffee houses, Zurich is famous for its good coffee. And he said, oh, the girls are much prettier at Starbucks. I said, really? I'll have to go take a look. <laughs> That's Melusina. You know, she called him. The siren. Uh, the siren called him to Starbucks. So why did Starbucks use that uh, image? Well, then you go to Seattle and you... Now you're with Joseph Campbell, and you go into Starbucks, and Joseph Campbell starts telling you about uh, the meaning of Melusina in mythology. You know, she's quite dangerous. She's beautiful. She's alluring. Uh, she calls to you, but be careful. You know, uh, you could you could get into trouble with Melusina. She can pull sailors to the rocks. So you think, well, that's very interesting. Let's have a cup of coffee. We have a conversation <laughs> with Joseph Campbell about the mythology. You're still not experiencing the symbol, but you're getting some information about traditional symbols that they have been thought about. And then you go into a Starbucks in Moscow, and you're sitting there, and you see Grushenka come into the room. She is Melusina. Do you know who Grushenka is? I don't. And the brothers Karamazov, she drives all the men crazy. They're all running after her, and she plays with them. Uh, she's very mischievous. She's very destructive. They die for her. Everybody is destroyed by Melusina. And you see Grushenko in Moscow, and you know you cannot live without her now you've experienced a symbol you're experiencing the anima now okay it's what we call the anima and it's so powerful that it will take your breath away it will destroy your bank account so you become irrational following the symbol and she plays with you uh, so the experience of a symbol is a, is a numinous experience, as we say. If you get the full impact of a symbol, it changes your life, for the better or worse. Um, doesn't mean that experiencing the anima is necessarily a bad thing, but you have to be careful, and eventually you may 
be able to take that projection back and become very creative and very playful yourself. Um, the, uh, uh, if you think of Saul on the road to Damascus, he has a moment of transformation. He, he sees something, he hears a voice, and uh, his whole life has changed. We call that metanoia. Uh, your whole um, way of thinking and feeling is changed by a big symbolic experience. So um, symbols are, are um, in Jungian um, circles taken with, with great respect. We see them as very powerful images that can call the depths out of us, the depths of our feeling, our imagination, our longing, our desire. Um, and, um, we, uh, you know, we, we become uh, taken over by them. Um, and if you're in a group of people that's taken over by a symbolic force, you, you lose your identity. You become one with the mass. And uh, we know politicians are good at this. Uh, Hitler was a genius. He played Wagner at his mass rallies in Nuremberg and listened to Wagner. Nietzsche said it took him three days to get over listening to the prelude to Parsifal um, uh, because he was so sensitive to music. Um, uh, music, uh, the power of myth. Joseph Campbell writes a lot about the power of myth. Uh, it's a force. And so what we try to do in Jungian work is live with these powers without being taken over by them. And um, we try to let them work on us and we work on them and we try to form a bridge or collaborative engagement with them and they will change us. Um, and to some extent they change as well. Jung did this work for himself, he was very courageous. Um, we read about it in the Red Book. He had a period of time where he was deeply engaged with symbols that came to him as in his active imaginations. And um, he, he, he changed from a Freudian analyst to, to Jung. He became Jung. The Jung we know is a result of that process. Uh, what he says, it's very interesting. You know, he wrote a book called Symbols of Transformation. Uh, that's, that's the title of volume five of the collected works. Um, and he links symbols with transformation. And before he had the experience himself, he studied it. Um, uh, the record of a, of a patient uh, that had been um, published in, a, in a, a psychiatric journal in Geneva. Her name was Miss Miller. She was an American, and she had these daydreams, active, imagine, uh, imaginary um, experiences while she was traveling in Europe. And Jung became fascinated by them, and he amplified them. So he took her what seemed like everyday day, daydreams, and he started seeing, oh, parallels. This, uh, this, this looks like something from um, uh, Indian mythology or American mythology. He gets fascinated by Hiawatha yeah. at one point. Um, and so he starts exploring the world of mythology uh, that he finds embedded in her seemingly kind of trivial, insignificant daydreams. Um, now, he's not working with her as a patient. He's not doing therapy with her. He, he's just he's being Joseph Campbell. He's looking at it theoretically, philosophically, psychologically. And that so fascinated him that um, he decided to do an experiment himself to see if he could um, stimulate his imagination to engage with figures like she apparently could do very 
um, automatically, very easily. It wasn't easy for him because he was a trained scientist, a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, a, a psychoanalyst. You know, that blocks your imagination. You've got, you've got too much theory in your head. Uh, so he had to let all that go uh, and go swimming out into the sea of the unconscious. And it, it took him a while to get any um, response. Um, but once he did, it really took off, um, and he heard a response. He called out of his window and kusnacht, uh, My soul, where are you? I've lost you. Uh, my soul, where are you? What is, what's he talking about? I wonder if Emma overheard him calling out to his soul, No, I'm over here. I'm, I'm in the <laughs> other room. Don't worry. <laughs> Oh, Here he's I am. calling for somebody else. <laughs> and then she appears. He's sitting in the desert. And she says, uh, um, wait, wait. And he says, oh, I'm so impatient. I've been waiting and waiting. I want to talk to you. I want to lie in your lap. And she says, I'm not your mother. You can't lie in my lap. So he gets a fight from her. You know, they have a confrontation. And she doesn't do what he wants him to. And that is where he discovers the autonomy of the unconscious, that these symbols are, have a life of their own. They're not under the control of the, of the conscious ego. So his ego remains intact throughout his, all of his uh, experiences in the Red Book, but the other figures that he is speaking with and encountering teach him things, uh, give him uh, information, he interacts with them. At one point, he uh, becomes uh, uh, identified with the crucified Christ, even um, undergoes a kind of crucifixion experience, it has a lot of experiences that are very powerful, very emotional. Some colleagues of, our, of mine here in Zurich and I created a script, of seven, seven scenes from the Red Book, and we enacted those scenes. And this, this crucifixion was one of them, and eating the liver of the, of the killed child was another one. And uh, we took it um, around the world. We, we performed it in Moscow and or in St. Petersburg. We performed it in Qingdao, China, and Taipei, and Zurich a couple of times, Paris. And in China, we had an audience of seven or 800 people watching it. And they had a translation that was um, put up on a, on a screen on the side so they could follow in Chinese as the English was being performed. And in the discussion afterwards, a man um, stood up and he said, I had no idea Jung suffered so much. Uh, and it, it, impressed, it impressed that audience in China, the impact that these experiences had on Jung. These are experiences of the symbolic world. Uh, they were his, uh, his, his experience on the road to Damascus. They changed him into a completely different kind of uh, psychologist and thinker. He became young as a result, but write the books that he wrote afterwards. These experiences that Jung had uh, or um, Saul on the road to Damascus, who then became Paul, uh, are so numinous, so intense. Um, but I'm thinking that for many people, uh, there are other avenues, other dimensions, other ways to live a symbolic life uh, yeah. w without necessarily being blasted off your horse and, <laughs> and being yeah. blind for three days. Yeah, I'm giving uh, extreme <laughs> examples. <laughs> So um, what does it look like for um, us mere mortals? <laughs> well, they were mere mortals, too. Paul was a mere mortal. <laughs> Jung was a mere mortal. We're all made of clay. But um, 
I think uh, some people have very powerful numinous experiences. Um, uh, there's a lot of people nowadays discussing uh, psychedelics. It's coming back very strongly as a mode of treatment for certain types of mental yeah. illness and so on. And some people are also attempting to use it um, as a part of uh, uh, an individuation journey, let's say, under the um, supervision or with the assistance of an analyst. And there are some analysts who are now trained, uh, have trained themselves and have had the experience, and they will assist people if they want to do that. Personally, I've, I've not been involved in it, but I've heard a lot about it. So it's a way of trying to have a very powerful experience of the symbolic unconscious. It isn't always to be advised. Uh, uh, it can have very um, detrimental side effects as well. But that's a big experience. Um, the types of numinous experiences that I work with in my everyday work as an analyst or I've experienced myself are, you could say, much more tame than that. They're, they come in the form of, um, I would say, uh, basically three varieties, okay? Uh, dreams, uh, active imagination, and what we call visions. Um, and there's a, a difference between those three. Everybody knows what a dream is, uh, whether they pay attention to their dreams or not. If you tell them, uh, uh, you know, you, you can inform them. If they don't think they have dreams, they do. Uh, that's been proven scientifically in sleep labs and so on. Everybody dreams. Um, and sometimes you have a very powerful dream and you wake up with it. It may be a nightmare, it may be a recurring dream, um, um, I, uh, a dream uh, uh, repeating a trauma, whatever. These are very strong dreams. Um, and Jung made a distinction between what he called small dreams and big dreams. So a big dream uh, is a symbolic dream, and it's one that analysts are very interested in, pay a lot of attention to. Uh, but it's a bit deceptive because sometimes a small dream hides a symbol. If you if you um, look at it carefully, you'll you'll find something in it. Uh, if you have an eye for symbols, that uh, could lead you um, into further uh, investigation. And and then what is sometimes recommended is to pick up that image in the dream and and use it in an active imagination. Now, active imagination is what Jung was doing in the Red Book experience. It's a deliberate effort while you're awake to engage your imagination. And um, uh, there are certain rules for how to do it and can give you some tips, but it's an it's, it's a intentional, type of effort. It's a, a it's a form of meditation. You sit down, try to exclude external uh, distractions, turn off your cell phone, don't pay attention to noises around you, or take a walk in a quiet place, sit, sit on a park bench, wherever, and spend 20 or 30 minutes just meditating and concentrating and letting something appear. And when when something appears, uh, you look at it, you engage with it. You don't force it, you, don't, you aren't making it up, so on and so forth. That's active imagination. It's very intentional. Dream is not intentional. You dream whether you want to or not. Go to sleep and you have a dream. A vision is also unintentional. That's what Paul had, saw on the road to Damascus. Um, and and it's, a, uh, it's a basically a hallucination. Okay? You see something that isn't there. Uh, it doesn't mean you're going crazy necessarily or having a schizophrenic break or something. Uh, perfectly normal people will have visions sometimes. Uh, uh, it's an altered state of consciousness for whatever reason. Um, and many people have something close to that experience in what are called hypnagogic states. 
And that's between sleeping, between being awake and going to sleep. There's an in-between period there where you're not quite awake and you're not quite asleep and very vivid images will come to you. Um, and then you'll suddenly sit up and you think, wow, that, that's what it was just as though it was real. Uh, well, it was real in its own way, psychically real. That's a, a type of vision. But other times, you know, people will be standing in their kitchen. A man told me not too long ago, it was Easter Sunday morning. He has a strong religious background, but he's never had a vision before. And he's kind of skeptical in his later years about the whole thing. Uh, but he was standing on Easter Sunday morning in his kitchen. Um, and suddenly he saw uh, Christ standing in front of him, the risen Christ. And he looked at him and uh, um, they, they sort of embraced each other and a very strong feeling involved um, and uh, lasted for 30 seconds or so and then it faded. So he brought this into analysis with me and we've been working on it ever since. It's the first time he's had a kind of break, religious breakthrough in his life, even though he's been officially religious all his life. Uh, but it was always very much in his head and texts and uh, sermons and thoughts, but never uh, a living experience like that. And he has a very hard time doing active imagination, turning off his head. This just came to him uh, and hit him like that. And so um, the unconscious will sometimes manifest itself that way. Uh, they, uh, uh, it, uh, I remember um, my colleague, uh, he was a, a very senior analyst when I was young and in training in Zurich. His name was Harry Wilmer. Oh, and uh, you probably yeah. know the name. Yeah. I think he invented... Uh, um, uh, what was it called? Um, therapeutic communities in hospitals and so on. He worked a lot with in the VA with um, um, soldiers who were coming back, vets from Vietnam at that time. And they would have a lot of um, um, recurring uh, episod uh, episodic memories and visions of their traumas and so on. Um, and he made a distinction between um, hallucinations and visions that I'll never forget in a lecture. Just in passing, he said, the difference is that a vision is meaningful and it has a coherence to it. Hallucinations are usually very frightening. They're repetitive. Um, and they're based on some pathological reason or background, something traumatic. Uh, but visions are not a sign of mental illness. Um, I think he had some visions himself. Um, and Jung had these. And if you read Memories, Dreams, Reflections, he reports a number of vision experiences. Uh, one night he woke up and he looked to the foot of his bed and he saw a figure of Christ standing at the foot of his bed, uh, green. It's called the Green Christ. Uh, didn't last very long and then faded away. And, and uh, he writes about that and he thought a lot about it and related that figure to alchemy, his alchemical studies and so on. So uh, what Jung would do with these experiences is what we're all taught to do as analysts. And that is to take the experience and work with it. To have, just have the experience by itself isn't enough. Our Patreon has had a makeover. There's lots of new content and ways to engage with us. Patrons who support us at the $5 level and up will now access Young Love, weekly bonus episodes where the three of us discuss dreams and questions sent in by supporters. At the $10 level, you can vote on topics for podcast episodes and vote on which guests we invite. And at the $25 level, you'll also be able to watch behind-the-scenes content and even join us for occasional live events. If you'd like to be a part of all this, the link to our Patreon is in the show notes. Thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do it without you. What are the ways that people, our listeners, could work with the symbol, uh, both on their own and perhaps with uh, a trusted other? Yes. 
Well, there are a number of ways. Um, you can keep it going in active imagination if you have a symbol. Um, you can try to recall it and uh, continue living with it in active imagination. That's what I've done. Uh, and then it continues to develop. You know, uh, you might have a vision of of somebody standing beside you, and then you get into a conversation, and that leads somewhere else, and you develop a relationship. So you keep it going, and you keep a journal, write down your experiences. Jung also suggests quite strongly uh, um, doing something like painting a visionary experience. Um, he he was very keen on that. Uh, he, he's a very good painter. He's yeah. Actually, he's an artist. He, he didn't want to think of himself as an artist, but he is an artist. So he would paint. That's how he made the Red Book. But he made a lot of other paintings that aren't in the Red Book. Uh, and uh, he also did wood carvings and stone carvings. Bolingen, uh, his, his tower at Bolingen as a kind of um, representation, he said, of the self. Uh, he built it over a period of many years. Uh, it's a symbolic building. And he said he, that's where he feels most at home. So you can do lots of things with uh, now. When you do that, Jung drops this as a, just a, a kind of sly suggestion. Uh, I forget exactly where it is. I'll have to look it up. Uh, but he says um, these uh, objects that you, you create from your symbolic experiences have a couple of um, values. One is they help you to remember and recall the experience. You keep it with you. You know, you put, put the picture on your wall or on your desk, and you live with it like that. It, it reminds you of the, of the symbol. And uh, so it, it doesn't disappear as easily. And the second thing, he says, strangely, these uh, symbolic objects have a way of constellating synchronicities. There's a kind of magic around them. Now, he doesn't say very much about that because he doesn't want to sound woo-woo, and uh, people think he's a little off his rocker. But um, That's why we love him. That's what the alchemists had. You know, they had a little stone, like this little lapis philosophorum. <laughs> It's a little stone that you hold it up to the light. It's very brilliant red, but it looks like nothing much. I just keep it here on my desk. Uh, what they had was a, an object that they had created in the laboratory that um, had magical powers. So if they would touch something with that lapis philosophorum, that stone of the philosophers, uh, it could it could uh, transform lead into silver or gold, so they could, you know, do transformations. Or if you touch a wound with it, it had a healing power. Um, so that's uh, synchronicities. Uh, you wouldn't say that's causal, you know. But I had a, a teacher at the Jung Institute when I was a student. He was a psychiatrist, and he believed very much in. Um, uh, what do you call that effect? Placebo, the placebo oh, sure. effect. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. Uh, and he yeah. said uh, at the end, of, in, in the afternoon, he would distribute the uh, medications to the patients in his clinic. And he said he did it in a very ceremonial way. He did it like a priest would be giving mass, okay? And he said that increases the power of the medicine tremendously. You know, you aren't just throwing a pill down, but you've got the, the doctor handing you the pill in a very solemn way, giving you a blessing. And then you take the pill, and it has a much more powerful effect. So that's, the that's placebo effect is being studied by some, somebody at Harvard, a Harvard Medical School I read recently. It's well known. It's you know, very uh, powerful. <laughs> it's very powerful, that, yeah. Right? 
Marie, I want to I want to ask for clarification on something. So this is sort of a very uh, basic question, and it's a question that's come up for me before, and I don't usually have Marie Stein around to answer it for me. And here's the I'll question: take a step. What's the difference or relationship maybe between a symbol and an archetype? <gasps> yeah. Okay. Um, there are there's the archetype and there are archetypal images. Okay, so Jung makes a very important distinction. Um, you can read about this in a paper he wrote called "The Nature of the Psyche," in volume eight, and I use that a lot in my book, Jung's Map of the Soul. He, he lays out a spectrum. He says the psyche is like a spectrum from ultraviolet to infrared. On the infrared side, it it um, it disappears through a psychoid membrane into the body, into the physiological uh, uh, processes. And there's an interplay between body and psyche, the psychosomatic interplay. The psyche can affect the body, the body can affect the psyche through that psychoid membrane. He says on the other end of the spectrum, on the, on the uh, ultraviolet end of the spectrum, that's blue, it, this, it, the psyche disappears through, a, again, a psychoid barrier or membrane into, he says, what I can only call spirit. Okay, and that's where the archetype exists. And the archetype emits, like the body influences the psyche, the archetype influences the psyche by giving it images. So when you have powerful images coming into your dreams, for instance, we call them archetypal images, big dreams that are related to mythology and fairy tales and all that. Um, the um, archetype in the beyond the psyche, in the in that spiritual world, is emitting some energy and it's coming into the psyche, and then it takes the form of a couple of things. Uh, it can be an image or it can be a big idea. It can be an inspiration. You know, suddenly, aha, light goes on. You, you understand something. Um, so uh, now what is that spirit world? On the one hand, you, the psyche disappears into the material world. On the other hand, it disappears into the uh, spirit world. Okay. Now, there's a, uh, when Jung tried to tie that together, the material world and the spirit world, in his theory of synchronicity, something happens in the material world and in the psycho psychic world at the same time, and it has meaning, delivers meaning. Now, there's a new book out, not so new now, I guess, uh, by a man named Harold Ottmansbacher called Dual Aspect Monism. And they're, they're filling out Jung's suggested theory. Jung and Wolfgang Pauli uh, uh, worked on this quite a lot, and, and, and Jung wrote his paper on synchronicity. Um, and what dual aspect monism is, it does is take it further in a philosophical direction. But it basically, the hypothesis is that there is a, uh, a source. They call it the monad. It's an energy source, or it's it's um, it's being as such beyond what we can know or experience, and it sends out radiations or energies in a couple of directions. One is a psychological direction, and the other is a material direction. They have a common source, and when those two meet, you know. Uh, Jung gives the famous example of the dream of the scarab beetle. Um, uh, and then there's a tap on the window in his office, and he opens the window and grabs the beetle from the garden and says to the patient, there is your scarab beetle. Oh. <laughs> that was so shocking to her that she was instantly transformed. She had a satori <laughs> experience. But... Um, that's, uh, you know, dual aspect monism. It's an interesting idea. It has roots in Spinoza, who says there's only one substance, or not two substances, only one substance. Everything comes out of one substance, uh, mind, body, spirit, everything. 
So um, uh, it's a kind of monotheism, or um, uh, uh, and Jung calls synchronicity acts of creation in time. I'm not answering your question. Exactly, but what, is, <laughs> what is the difference between um, uh, image and archetype? Right. As I said, there are archetypal images. Right. But, we, but is, is yeah. the symbol uh, an image of the archetype? Mm -hmm. Is that what a symbol is communicating? Is, yeah. is well, an archetype? It, partially, yeah. It, yeah. It, it's, it's drawing on the archetype uh, that's invisible. Jung says the symbol is a magnet. Mm -hmm. It has a magnetic quality to it. So yeah, if you hold the symbol, and um, live with the symbol, it draws on deeper energies in the psyche beyond mm. your experience. It, it brings something to you. You know, when I was in Russia years ago, I did quite a lot of work in Russia. Um, we were working on bringing Jungian psychology after the Cold War to Russia. I was in a church. Um, they would reopen the churches shortly after it was possible. It was amazing to see how religion came back so quickly. People had been religious, but it was um, uh, you know, very dangerous. But now they could do it in the open. So I w went into this church one afternoon, and I watched the, um, the people coming in. There were mostly elderly women coming in, and they would kneel in front of the icons. You know, the, the picture of the virgin and the uh, child. And if you look at that picture as a sign, it's not very good art, you know. Um, you find these uh, pictures in, uh, you know, uh, used art shops and so on. But in the church and in that setting, it had a very special power. And so they would gaze at the icon. Uh, at that image, and then they would move forward and they would kiss it, and then they would slowly back away and move on to the next icon. And it gave them something. These icons were considered windows into eternity. You know, you if you look into them deeply, you will see the reality that they are drawing from. These are just pictures on a board, but. They're connected to, that's what a, an archetypal image is. It's connected to deeper sources of meaning and energy. And if you dwell on it, it gives you something. It gives you meaning. It gives you a sense of wholeness. It gives you a sense of um, fate and destiny uh, or belonging. You belong. You're a child of God. Mm -hmm. You are in the lap of the Virgin. She is consoling you for your suffering and so on. So it's very vivid and very powerful. And, you know, Jung spoke about the religions as uh, therapeutic institutions. They, they preserve the link between the conscious ego and the collective unconscious and the symbols of the collective unconscious, the archetypal images. They gave people access. And what we suffer from, Modern Man in Search of His Soul, Jung's book in the 1950s, is uh, a desacralization of the world as a result yeah. of the Enlightenment. We got a lot of benefits from the Enlightenment, a lot of technology and understanding of the material world, but we lost this connection to the symbolic world. And that's why Jung thought um, depth psychology was so important. It, is picking up where the religions drop the ball or where people can no longer find uh, their meaning in them or a source of um, connection to the spiritual world. Yeah. In a way, religion is making a comeback. Religions will never die out. They're dangerous in one way. You know, they lead people, they become ideological and political and they lose their spiritual values but uh they uh for many people they they remain uh a resource and i i fully respect that 
Jung said uh, when he uh, lapsed Catholic came to him for analysis, he said he made her into a better Catholic than she ever was before. <laughs> and the Pope, and he said the Pope sent me a thank you note because she was a, a Roman noblewoman and went back and told the Pope what Jung had done for her. Uh, so he didn't try to remove people from their religious roots at all, strengthen them, anything, because they are a resource, symbol, sim, symbolically speaking. Yeah, and I like that we can reach out to them um, in manners akin to you having a stone on your desk as a reminder of that we can have objects, we can, yes. we, we can paint a picture, not in order to become a great artist, but in order to connect our hands and our minds, our bodies with an image and sink into it. Yes. And, and that then perhaps like uh, the man who was not religious and saw the image of Christ on Easter morning, mm. uh, we're opening a portal for something to come through to us. That's that, right. uh, that we don't create it but we can reach out toward it mm -hmm. in, in all manner of relatively everyday ways. Absolutely. I think uh, linking the material world to the mm -hmm. um, symbolic world is very important. The, the problem uh, can arise that it just turns into a sign. Uh, when symbols turn into signs, they lose their power. They, they still mean something. You know, you see a cross on a church, it means there's a church there. In Switzerland, it's a Catholic church if there's a cross on it. If there's a rooster on it, it's a Protestant church. Um, Murray, can you talk a little bit about the difference between a symbol and a sign for our listeners who may not yeah. know the difference? A sign tells you something uh, you know, that is familiar. Like I it's said, already it's, known. Sign. It's, it's known. Mm -hmm. uh, Starbucks uh, on the on the window means there's coffee inside. You know that. Um, if you see uh, a, a church building, you know that it's a church. Um, I, I was in a. I went into a church uh, some years ago in uh, where was that? Portugal, I think it was. Yeah, somewhere in Portugal, and um, it was full of worshippers. You know. In Switzerland, the churches are empty mostly, but in Portugal, uh, I think they still have quite a strong uh, presence. Um, and they were truly worshiping. The priest was in. And so to me, it was there's a church. I think I'll step in. Uh, it's a sign. I couldn't participate in the worship because I'm not a Catholic. It, it doesn't speak to me. I don't have that. It doesn't, it doesn't resonate, but I could watch them, and I could see they were into it. They, they were experiencing something. So while the church for me is a sign for them, it's a symbol. They're going into a sacred space. That's a symbolic space. There's, there's a mystery there. And those, uh, um, you know, the, the, those sensors that are swinging around, smoke coming out of them, or curiosities for me. Oh, look at that uh, uh, man is, you know, blowing smoke. What, what's that all about? Uh, but if you're into the ritual and you participate in it, it has a very powerful effect. You know, it's, it's scaring away the bad spirits. It's uh, cleansing. It's creating a sacred space. Uh, so this, it's a very important difference between sign and you just look at signs, it's in your head, you understand it, but symbols are deep experiences. And I think this is relevant in lots of contexts, but maybe particularly when we work with dreams, because I think if we're not familiar with dream work, we tend to, we tend to think of some of the images in our dreams as signs. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, this yep. means this. That's you know, right. I dreamt about a tiger, so that means that. Uh, something's going to attack me this week or something like that. <laughs> or uh, uh, my inner tiger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, you know, uh, uh, James Hall, who is, uh, you might know, I've heard of him too. He was a uh, founder of the Interregional Society and was a man I knew well. He talked about archetypal reductionism. 
Huh, that's great. You know, yeah. That's when you, you just give a name to something in a dream. You say, oh, that's your instincts. Oh, that's an animal. That's your instincts. Or that's a bird. That's your uh, that's something to do with the spirit or animus or something. Just naming things. Uh, you're treating them as signs. It, it can be helpful. A theory can be helpful. It gives you a kind of orientation. Right. But um, a, a good dream, we, we don't really um, interpret dreams the way Freud did. Okay, Freud gives you the reduced meaning of the dream. It means you want to sleep with your mother. Okay, period, <laughs> end of the story. <laughs> That's it. Um, uh, Jung would take the mother as the great mother in the lap of the mother. It's not regressive necessarily. Have the experience. Um, and uh, when I work with dreams uh, in analysis with, with my clients, um, I try to re-experience the dream with them. They tell me the they tell me the dream that they've had. Sometimes they have written it down, and then I ask them about details, and we sort of go into a reverie state of yeah living uh, in the dream together, mm -hmm. and then exploring it and seeing where it might lead. You no know, amplifications that uh, Jung suggests if you have some references. In your mind, so somebody told me about a dream about an owl the other day, and immediately I thought of Athena and yeah, sure. uh, uh, wisdom and all that. But that, that isn't enough, but it can give you some direction where to go and experience the wisdom of seeing in the dark that mm -hmm. the owl seems to have. And, you know, it's a kind of a spiritual guide. Murray, when people are working with dreams, let's say they have, you know, a whole scenario unfolds. Would they treat every image as a symbol, or is there a kind of hierarchy with which they would look at a dream? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we speak about objective and subjective interpretation of dreams. Um, if you dream about your your uh, your partner, your ch your children, your neighbor, somebody that you have a a, a relationship with. In, in the present time, and maybe you talked to the day before, or you, um, and you dream about that person, that person appears in your dream, unless they are, look really different and act very different from the way they do in real life, in which case you would start thinking, well, there, maybe there's something symbolic here. You would treat it uh, on an objective level. Okay, this is saying something about the way my unconscious sees this relationship for this person. They're very present in my life. They're, you know, we are connected, we're interacting with each other. And I see them in a certain way consciously, and maybe my unconscious sees it in another way. So you try to match the unconscious to the conscious situation. And that doesn't tell you anything objective about the person, but it can tell you something about the relationship. And, and the levels of relationship. The subjective interpretation says the image is a part of your psyche. It's, it's, it belongs to the inner world. So if you, uh, the man who told me that dream, uh, dreaming about an owl, I asked him if he'd seen any owls lately, and he said, no, they don't live in this part of the country. So it was clearly a symbolic experience. Uh, the owl entered into his dream for no uh, obvious reason. Um, you know, we ask about the day before, what happened the day before, day's residue, and so on. And sometimes we can clearly link a dream to something that happened recently. The dream still gives us some further, uh, we could say, information or perspective on what happened the day before. It isn't just a reflection unless it's a, an exact repetition, in which case there's probably a trauma involved. You know, Traumatic experiences have a, a way of repeating themselves for a while. So, Murray, I'm thinking about how we might sort out some hierarchy of perhaps intensities. For instance, we all have dreams, and I'll make one up. Um, I'm walking down the street, I turn left, you know, I see a horse gallop across my path. And then I walk into an ice cream store and I order some chocolate ice cream and then I, I eat the ice cream. 
So there's a sequence of images that we remember, but I get the sense that there is something different about one of those images being identified as a symbol, because the symbol seems to have so much more impact than perhaps maybe other images that a dream would have. Although often, when we're learning dream interpretation, we tend to th- to unpack each image as if it is a symbol. But but I don't know if that's quite the right attitude. Well, um, <laughs> practically speaking, we often don't have enough time to work on all the, all the images in a dream. Mm. But you're right, they're a kind of gar- garden variety um, moments in dreams, um, images or experiences, stories that uh, don't really strike us as anything special. They're kind of everyday experiences as we have them during waking life. Uh, going into a, um, a shop and, and having a chocolate mm-hmm. ice cream uh, seems quite ordinary, unless it's not. You know, if it's not ordinary, then one would want to pay some special attention to it. That horse running across the path um, uh, seems more extraordinary uh, and something to look at more on a symbolic level. And also turning left, we think turning right is going more toward consciousness and away from the unconscious. Turning left, you're going more into the unconscious. So what does that mean? What Jung says about the unconscious is it's the unknown. Uh, You don't know what's there. Now, if a store with ice cream is there, what's it doing there? (laughs) And uh, it may be something very special. It may remind you of a certain moment in your childhood uh, that, you know, your father took your little hand and took you into the store and bought you an ice cream cone. and The only nice thing he ever did with you or, you know, a special, a special moment, a special memory. Uh, one thing I find about dreams is that they often bring back memories that we have tucked away, forgotten, or stored in an attic somewhere, and out they come, and you dream of somebody you haven't seen in 20 or 30 years, a high school friend or something, and then you start talking about them, and memories come back, and uh, very strong feelings often, and uh, that's one thing we do quite a bit in analysis. We reconstruct a narrative and uh, things that didn't seem very important when they happened might be quite important uh, in the long term. That moment of the, the ice cream cone. Uh, my wife has told me many times about uh, an incident where her father took uh, her and her little friends into a store and um, bought them all a bunch of candy. And, and one little girl said, well, I'll take a piece of that. And he said, is that all you want? You need more than that. And this generosity of the father was so important in her life. Uh, so that's a very precious memory. And dreams will sometimes bring back things like that uh, in a moments that are emotionally meaningful. Yeah. Be kind of emotional medicine yes. that we find yeah. has yeah. been tickled by yeah. these associations. But I think what I'm hearing is, well, there's many healing valences in a dream, but it might be that it's the it's the unusual thing or perhaps the uncanny um, piece that might attract our attention and curiosity as to whether or not it is a it is a symbolic piece, like the horse galloping across the New York. You know, Avenue on my way to get the the ice cream is uh, the unconscious is really like waving something yes, in front of us just, yeah. just in case we uh, didn't catch it more subtly. Uncanny and, is a good word for the unconscious. Uh, Freud used that word uh, unheimlich in German, and it's uh, it's related to numinous. Uh, numinous experiences are uncanny. There's something mysterious there, something that uh, we can't explain, that, but that catches our attention. And uh, uh, Rudolf Otto said, when you have a numinous experience, it makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. 
you know, you get goosebumps, things like that. That's, um, yeah. So we might then, if the horse gives us that subjective gasp, or there's something so magical about retelling it, that that might give us a sense that the unconscious is um, is putting a, a magnitude of energy mm-hmm. you know, into that image, and that the subjective response might give us a clue that this is a symbol, and as you were saying, a symbol of transformation, Mm -hmm. that it offers a potential to affect the ego, um, perhaps more dynamically or more significantly than perhaps the asphalt that we saw in the dream under our feet. I always look at animals uh, carefully in dreams, and uh, I I like to know, um, is it a healthy animal? Or is it a... A failing animal has to do with our physical being, too, and our instincts. Or a talking animal. A talking animal, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You see those in the movies sometimes. Yes, yes. Sometimes in dreams. I I heard about a talking tree lately, uh, a tree Mm -hmm. that actually spoke to a person. A dryad. I found that quite interesting. (laughs) I had a dream of three talking parrots in the backyard. and it was so obvious that it was clearly about the podcast. But, but really? I was like, <laughs> of course it's parrots. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, what could those three talking parrots mean in the backyard? <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, I wonder if this would actually be a good time to switch to talking about a dream. So our dreamer today is a 33-year-old male. He works as a barista and coffee roaster, and he has a wonderful title for the dream, The Coffee War. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) The dream starts with me going on a journey to South America. As I was walking over a meadow in South America, I started to feel a deep connection to nature and to a greater spirit. Some people of the travel group I was with started jumping in a river to have some fun, but I couldn't because I was afraid of piranhas, so I stayed out. After a while, though, I realized that the river is artificial, so there wasn't even anything alive in it, and the real river was cut off from that artificial river. After that, The travel group transformed into a school class, and I was back at school. I was annoyed because we didn't really learn something, and I complained that I wanted to move to the next task, because I was already wasting half of my life. Then suddenly, the group transformed again, and we were knights, and it was announced that we needed to go to war and attack the castle of Constantinople. But before that, the old king of our group resigned his throne, and a new king was crowned. The new king was tall and strong, and we would all gather around him. All the other men were also tall and strong, only I was much smaller only half the size of the other men. Everyone gathered in a circle around the new king and yelled, To die for a king will bring us honor. Then we went to attack the castle. I was the first in the line charging the castle. Enemies were shooting arrows at me, so I jumped behind a small wall and realized that I was there all alone. I must have gone to the wrong place. So I went back to search for the other knights and found them sitting in a cafeteria. So I sat down with them and started drinking really bad coffee (laughs) from a broken vending machine. As I was looking around me, seeing all these knights in armor drinking coffee out of paper cups, I was thinking to myself, what in the world am I even doing here? 
For context, he writes, I'm thinking about changing career at the moment, but I feel really stuck and blocked because I have no formal education and I feel it's too late. He says the main feelings in the dream were standing in the circle with the other knights, I felt strong and empowered, even though I was smaller than them. But I am a small man in real life, so I'm used to being smaller than everyone else. And for associations, he shares, coffee, I started working in the coffee industry because I quit school when I was 18 years old. Ever since them, I'm beating myself up about quitting school. I've never been to South America or even seen a piranha in real life. So I, 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 I find this dream really poignant just off the bat. I, I, it feels really poignant. It feels like it's a, I mean, there's this, it's, this is a question of kind of male initiation. And there are many images, I think, that relate to that in the dream. Um, it also has a lively sense of humor, I think, the dream does, which is, uh, yeah, you've got a real interlocutor here when, when your dream is uh, offering you these really intriguing, compelling images, like knights in armor drinking coffee out of paper cups in the cafeteria, <laughs> you know. Well, it's such a flaccid interruption from his heroic journey. Yeah. That he might have started in life. He started ready to go to war, and there he is. Oh, in that the was Greece a crusade. Drinking coffee. It was yeah, a crusade, yeah. A paper cup. Well, I was struck uh, by the, um, the opening. He goes to South America. Um, where he's never been, okay? So when you dream of a place you've never been, you're deep in the unconscious, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, North Americans typically dream of South America, Europeans dream of Africa mm -hmm. or India, something like that. And um, so, and, and there he comes upon this amazing situation of an artificial river and a true river. Yes. And the true river is blocked off. So the false and the true. Mm -hmm. uh, we often speak about true self, false self. Okay, what is the true self? I think he's beginning to experience something of the true self in his life. That's why he wants to make a change. And being ashamed and regretting and feeling small is a signal. Uh, it's not the end of the story. That's that's a. Um, uh, it means you you need to do something. Uh, you need to grow yourself, and um, you can. Mm -hmm. What is his age? Thirty something. Thirty three. That's not too old to go to school, for God's sake. Not at all. And Christ was thirty three when he started his mission. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. It's never too late. <laughs> no, uh, it's. Um, 33 is, uh, is approaching midlife. I'd, you know, if, if I were working with him, I'd want to know more about him. You know, what is his, why did he drop out of school? What was his family life? Uh, does he have a relationship? Does he have friends, support? Um, but he, he says he's stuck. He wants to make a change. So that's it's a moment of, it's a turning point in his life. Mm, yeah, I, lo I love that you lifted that up, Murray. It's true. I think that feeling of feeling small or desperate or, or stuck, it, it, it is the thing that prods us out into more growth. You know, one of the things that I notice about, uh, sometimes with dreams like this, I'll break it out into scenes. So we've got the first scene is uh, South America with the rivers. The second scene is back at school and feeling frustrated because he's not learning anything. The third scene is attacking the castle and then kind of winding up getting lost. And then the fourth scene is drinking coffee in the cafeteria. And, and each of those four scenes kind of has something in common that you, you already picked up and, and elucidated, Murray, which is the sense that it kind of looks, um, it looks like one thing and then it's another. 
and it's and the other thing is kind of a disappointment. So it looks like there's this this uh, wonderful opportunity to jump into this river, which is a little fraught with danger because there might be piranhas in it, but other people don't seem concerned about it. But then it's not it's not the real river, and there's nothing living in it. The second scene, it's like you're back at school, but we're not learning anything. The third scene is we're going to attack the castle. Yay. And we have a new king and everything. But then he kind of winds up behind this wall by himself. And then the fourth scene is like, oh, and now we're, we're drinking coffee. So there's, there's a sense of, um, of discovering that, um, you, you know, and I think, I think essentially Marie already said this, but something like dis- discovering that, um, that the mission is not what you thought it was or, or that, uh, or, or that's, or that we're we're cut off from from something life giving, and disappointment. Disappointment. Yep. O- over and over again, I can't get in the river because it's artificial. Um, go to school, but I don't learn anything, uh, et cetera. Uh, I would be curious about that of at this turning point in life, uh, is there um, a feeling that, you know, that it won't yield good results, that it won't be satisfying? Well, uh, all of that I see, but I'm very interested in the way that the, the dream ego interferes with what's being offered in the dream. And something, Murray, that I've, I've become increasingly interested in is the difference between what the dream maker is providing image by image and what does the dream ego do with that. And I think there's such an an important differentiation. So in the beginning, they're starting to go on a journey to South America and he's walking over a meadow. The deep connection to the great spirit is interesting and, of course, is subjective. We don't know that there's a great spirit, but people from the travel group are jumping in a river to have some fun. What we see is that he wouldn't jump into life because he's afraid of something that doesn't exist. There aren't piranhas in the water. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're beginning to see the problem right from the beginning is seeing danger where it does not exist. And he's already separated himself out from the the response to the adventure because of the piranhas in his mind. So my first inquiry would be all about piranhas (laughs) and Who are these piranhas Mm -hmm. that you assume are um, are so terrifying? And and the assumption that they're there has kept you from doing, I suspect, all kinds of things, Mm -hmm. like going to school. So I'm looking for the piranhas that continue to come forward, because there's the real river where there are no piranhas, then there's the, the fake rivers of his mind. So he's back at school, and then I'm annoyed because we didn't learn anything, and I want to be moved to the new task because I wasted my life. That's a piranha. <laughs> <laughs> it's another like aggressive, mm-hmm. gobbling up complex that's interfering with him swimming in the water with his cohorts and having a good time. Again, they're, they're now in a heroic war. And all of this thing about the new king and the old king, of course, the new attitude and the old attitude. And it all seems okay. And then once the enemies are shooting arrows at him, once there's engagement, which are the piranhas, once again, he jumps to the wrong place. So we have this sense that fear of, of the thing is where he jumps away from the encounter over yeah. and over again. And what he's left with 
after he's wrung the joy, the libido, the dynamism, his own phallic curiosity, he's wrung it all out, and he's left with bad coffee in a paper cup. But I'm so interested in these fears, these piranhas that he projects into life and into the dream. Well, what comes to my mind, he probably was bullied in school. And so Mm -hmm. he's small and um, uh, there are piranhas out there. Uh, Maybe not in that river, but there are piranhas in the world. And he's very cautious. Uh, I I don't hold that against him, that caution. No. Um, Yeah. But I think you're right. It gets the best of him. Uh, but the dream also says there's a true river somewhere. And I yes. find that very, yes. uh, it's a very, very strong, yeah, positive message. But what is a river? Um, you know, the river of life getting into the flow. Um, as you say, uh, Joseph participating with the army, he does participate, and he's the first to attack. So he's got courage. He's yep. got right. He's got the armor on, and he. <laughs> but then he jumps. Thing. But then he jumps to the wrong place. Exactly. Well, he, he's protecting himself. He, he jumps to you, you. You want to get out of the? I'm going to defend his dream ego a bit. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <great. Yeah. laughs> Go for he it. jumps out of the way of the arrows. I would too. Uh, you know. But he does end up alone, you know. And then, and then he says, I must have gone to the wrong place. Yeah, but maybe he didn't. Maybe the slings he survived. And the slings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people experience loneliness these days. It's, yes. It's, yeah. They talk about an epidemic of loneliness. Mm-hmm. And he is quite alone. And, uh, uh, but he's not at the end. He's with his cohort, and they're drinking bad coffee, but he's with them. And uh, they uh, attack in Constantinople. It's interesting. He has this geography in his dream. Yeah, South America that's right. and yeah. Constantinople is the gateway to the east. You know, right. it, it's the home of the Roman Empire after Rome collapsed, and it's the home of um, the Orthodox Christian religion. And it was occupied is occupied by the Turks, you know, and the Christians tried to retake it several times in the Middle Ages, in the, mm. in the Crusades, um, mm-hmm. that were mostly a failure. But um, there, there is something of a, maybe a religious impulse. He talks about the, the great spirit and being on a crusade with a sure. new king. Sure. There's there's something uh, there's energy there and there's a there real sure is. real river, um, and being in a school and you know and being bored and you, that isn't necessarily bad. You go to a different school, uh, uh, jump classes. A lot of kids are bored in school, um, but uh, don't drop out. Uh, Stay in the, stay you know, he in the wants battle. to go back to school. He says it's too late, but it's not too late. At 33, he can go to a junior college for a couple of years and transfer to a college and get a graduate degree and he can become a doctor. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, people do yeah. that. We, we, have a, we have a colleague, I'll just say, who, who's a Jungian analyst, very accomplished, wonderful analyst. And I think she, when she decided to become an analyst, she had to get her undergraduate degree. And that, she probably did that in her 50s. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I know lots of do. people who have done that. Uh, yeah. Girls used to get married when they were 18, 20, drop out of college, and then have a couple of children, and then go back and become professionally uh, accomplished in the second half of life. And, you know, he can do that. But it's going, to take, uh, it's going to take courage. It's going to take stamina, resilience. You'll have setbacks. Um, and he won't like everything that comes along. But... Um, I think he can do it. I'm, I'm, I would cheer him on. He's got all these knights, you know, gathering around him. That's a lot of masculine dynamism. A I do want king. to say that there is something that happens. Again, I like to analyze the ego defenses because I think that can help someone. Yeah. Because he says, 
I couldn't jump into the river because I'm afraid of piranhas. And after a while, I realized that there wasn't anything alive in it anyway. But that's what's one of the ways that we um, justify our fears, is that we devalue the thing that we don't engage because it's too painful to actually keep looking at the river with all my friends frolicking in it. Hmm. Um, so that, I then I have to create this story in my mind of why I didn't jump in. So there's piranhas, they're in there, but you know, there's nothing in that river that's worth anything anyway, and it's not even a real river. And, you know, so I don't need to trouble myself about it because there's something yeah. really good somewhere else in the world. Maybe that's and why that's, you dropped think, out of high school, maybe. Ex- exactly. So, the, again, I love your association with the bullies as piranhas, and how do we cope with the things that we, that we are blocked off to us as we make it not matter? You know, I'm uh, going to the very end of the dream and uh, thinking about how the end of the dream is really very ordinary. We just you know, wait. Uh, that he's uh, with the other knights, but they're doing something so mundane, uh, drinking coffee, out, bad coffee out of paper cups. And, and I wonder if part of the dream is uh, you know, no, you don't have to go to South America and swim in a river, and you don't have to wage uh, war uh, and attack the castle in Constantinople. It's perfectly okay to be with the knights drinking coffee, uh, to become ordinary. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very but, ordinary, yeah. yeah. But just the contrast between these heroic missions and... Uh, hang out with these guys. Have some coffee. Uh, what, what will you talk about? Uh, th- and it's okay. I'm thinking, I'm reaching for something. I don't know if I have my hands around it yet, but Joseph, I really like uh, you know, what you did with it, talking about his fears and his defenses. And Murray, I'm, I'm taking to heart what you said about standing up for his, for his dream ego. And my fantasy is something like, at some point, the fears may have been very adaptive. Like mm-hmm. maybe going to college at when he was eighteen was really the wrong thing. Uh, but 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 it's sort of that discernment about when you know jumping away from the battle is the right thing, and and maybe very adaptive. And when it maybe lands us in the wrong place and makes us miss the true river or or whatever. So I'm I'm just kind of holding holding all of that that. You know, because I, I think you're you're right, Murray. I mean, he does have courage. He is the first one into the fray. Um, there, there is strength there. There is, as we've all said, a lot of dynamism, and um, and sometimes it is right to be really cautious and to uh, duck out of the way or be wary of the piranhas. But maybe there is a question of trying to really learn. When, when that's the savvy response and when it's actually avoidant. Yeah, avoidant. <laughs> avoidant would be the issue. Yeah. And he has a conflict with, because of the announcement, to die for a king will bring us honor. Mm-hmm. But then when the arrows are coming towards him, he, he rethinks that cheer. <laughs> 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 that doesn't seem so great. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> honor is not the best thing that I can look for yeah. at this point in my life. <laughs> So, so there is this complicated that when the new, tall, strong king in him, like, begins to come forward, that there's this um, martyring mm-hmm. that gets activated in the psyche, which, of course, I'm, I don't know that that's a great response either. But <laughs> I, I want to talk just a bit about coffee, and, and maybe I'm picking up on what you said, Deb, but may, maybe I'm kind of having a slightly different experience of it. There's something about, and I'm going to go back and check the language. So what he says is um, really bad coffee from a broken vending machine. <laughs> so in armor, drinking coffee, but out of paper cups, you know, which you, you don't you usually don't, you, even, at, even at Starbucks, which has come up, there's been a lot of coffee in this episode. You know, the, the cups are a little more substantial. So he, and he works in the coffee industry. And, and it's, it's almost like it's saying, like, I'm, I'm going to, 
venture into being maybe a little bit literal, but it, it I think I think the dream is being say, maybe saying like coffee is not where it's at. <laughs> yes, it's not going to give you what you need. It also reminds me of being an extra on a movie set. <laughs> Like, <laughs> we're like, it's the king, run, run, take. Everyone's sitting there after you around drinking coffee out of bad paper cups, waiting for the next take. Oh, uh, that's funny. That's which funny, goes yeah. to what you were saying, Deb, is there's a theatrical production and then there's yeah. the reality. Yeah. Yes. I'm just shooting back some caffeine for the next take. A- and he is with the cohort. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So There's at least one of them, yeah. Uh, he's he's together with people, which he was not at the river. He yeah. didn't like being in school. Um, he was all by himself when he's off to uh, conquer the castle of Can- Constantinople. But now he is with a cohort, and it is very, very ordinary. But he's connected. Uh, and I think there is something here about, um, you know, these dramatic scenes of, of the river in South America and the knights and the battle. And then, hey, how about we just hang out and have really bad coffee out of paper cups? It also makes me wonder about um, how much gaming this young man did and how much ah. he's still doing. Mm. Because yeah. that. That compensation, which we see heartbreakingly, oh yeah, yeah, is kids, you know, young men coming out of high school and then being very caught in these fantastical worlds of knights and battles and everything under the sun, and then you know, at the end of it, you know, we're all sitting around drinking bad coffee, um, and nothing's really been accomplished. So the incredible medicine at the end of the dream because there is a change of attitude and the change of attitude is though what in the world World am am i I even doing here that's great you're right which is maybe questioning aiming for instance or heroic fantasies or a kind of quixotic compensation about it's hard to interpret this dream since we don't know the dreamer but uh, that right. that's a very a good point yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's, um, that is he's a great never point. been to south america or certainly not constantinople where did those associations come from mm-hmm. um and it may be a kind of uh, virtual world that he has lived in but um i come back to the true river um that's something yeah. to search for yeah, right. it is. Get, get into. Um, and uh, and, and the, there's a kind of communion at the end. I like what you said, Deb. He's, uh, uh, he's with them. They're in, in their armor, but they're not in, in some glorious war. They're drinking very ordinary coffee. Mm-hmm. But they're, it, well, it's, uh, And it, uh, it reminds me a little bit of Jung's Siegfried dream, and I'm not sure how old he was when he had that. But part of the purpose of that dream was a recognition that he had had to kill off a kind of heroic attitude. Yeah. And and it could be that, um, you know, something similar is going on for this dreamer that, Uh that, uh, you know, hey, maybe I have to be ordinary and just go back and kind of slog through getting a degree. Yeah. And uh, I'm not going to be propelled into, you know, magical adventures. And it's time to sort of just sink back into ordinariness and... Do, you know, put one foot in front of the other and, uh, yeah. you know, even if it's boring, kind of get yeah. through this. But they're all, he's with knights. Uh, the knights are being, you know, hanging out and drinking coffee, but they are still there's, knights. There's potential. Uh, you know, they're, mm-hmm. so they're, they're, I think I would be interested in exploring, you know, the heads and tails of this particular coin of, the dream ego going, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? And um, also, but maybe this is what knights do. Uh, instead yeah. of roaring off mm-hmm. to battle and doing heroic stuff, maybe they, they lead regular lives. And maybe the question is, do I need this armor? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Because a lot of us being bullied or having really difficult childhoods yeah. We figure out yeah, how yeah. to survive. There are your defenses. And we're, yeah. armor, we're armored. Yeah. And I'm in a cafeteria, you know, snacking, drinking coffee. Do I need armor? 
<laughs> now, I would say is for those of us that were bullied in school, you do need armor in the cafeteria, yeah, right. yeah, by yeah. the way, <laughs> because yeah. it's not, it is a dangerous yeah, war zone. Is. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But, but in the current life, wait a minute, am I, am I still yeah. living as if I'm in the, the junior high school cafeteria mm-hmm. needing armor? Mm-hmm. Well, we we this dream uh, was very lively, and yeah. uh, you know we we've obviously all it's been sort of a projective test because we have had our, our own <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. imaginations about it. But I think we all are in this place where we're really kind of cheering the streamer on. Yes, hundred yes. percent. Certainly yeah. want to encourage him to yeah. make the changes he needs to, and yeah, get in the stream of life. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. There's a real you-can-do-it spirit here. Yeah. 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 Thanks for listening. To submit a dream, suggest an episode topic, or join our mailing list, visit our website, thisunionlife.com. If you enjoyed this episode, give us five stars and a good review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure to click the notification bell to be alerted whenever we upload new videos. And keep up with all things TJL by following us on Instagram, Facebook, X, 